Jason here, Blood Church, coming to you today. God bless each and every one of you. Going to take a look at uh, John, sorry about that, chapter 4 today a little bit. Here on the channel, if you're new, subscribe, thumbs up. Love to have you join our group of Bible-believing Christians, and we rightly divide the word of truth. Looking forward to our blessed hope, Titus 2.13, and the soon return of Jesus Christ. And if you can do the same thing, you can have that hope in your life, a higher level of you. And how do you do that? How do you become saved and, and live in eternity forever with the Lord rather than burn in hell? Hell is a real place, my friends. One sin can send you there. And so God gave us the perfect way to, to reconcile our sins, to be forgiven of our sins, to be atoned and be clean our, our soul be cleaned by the blood of Jesus Christ. He did that on the cross, according to the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, especially verses 3 and 4, but it's 1 through 4, where he died, he buried, and he rose again. But it's what he did on that cross. The blood shed forgives sins, past, present, future. All sins are forgiven, and you are now clean in terms of the eyes of God. Now, now you still have a fleshly body that's capable of sinning. And, and there's nothing else added to the perfect work. Every future sin, again, will be forgiven. But it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Of course, you should walk and learn to um, learn to walk with the Lord. But in terms of salvation, you would be completely saved. Let's look at John chapter 4. And I'm not going to read every single verse, but this is the story, the well, the water, and the, and the woman. That's what a lot of people hearken this to be. And then it goes on... Um, Personal work with a hardened sinner is starting at verse fifteen, um, but we're going to look just in here at some of the some of the applications in verses. You know, about nine through tw- you know about twenty five is a perfect example, a, a beautiful example of the problems that arise in in, in somebody's personal work, and a, and and then how a sinner will 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 try to make excuses, right? an argument against being saved or accepting Jesus, and and how this sort of story sort of relates to that. So let's take a look. So again, we do have uh, Jesus, and he's, if you look, he is near Jacob's well, verse 6. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And that's the Jewish time, the sixth hour is, is 12 noon um, because their day starts at a different time that, you know, than what the Western world would, would start a day. Um, it starts at, you know, at, at sunset. So, so anyway, excuse me. Uh, yeah, so it's the, you know, the sixth hour being noontime. And verse 7, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me drink. Wow, could you imagine God asking you to give him a drink? You know, that's sort of amazing, right? Um, and there's only two times that Christ asked for water. This is one of them. And the other one is at, at the cross at John nineteen twenty eight, And he was actually denied both times, um, which is interesting. Verse 8, For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. And verse 9, then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Which was true. And this was, again, the Jews saw themselves as righteous because they followed the law, and, and the heathens didn't, and Samarians were Gentiles. So that would be, you know, and, and her saying that, that would that this was a surprise, right, to her. That, that anybody, any Jew would ask. And so... In verse nine, you get this. You get we just read. You get a like a social argument about not accepting Jesus. Uh, it, it, you know, and it, it's not about not her not accepting him as the Messiah, but rather how how a person might say you know dealings of of culture, de- dealing in society, a social argument against you know being 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 a saved Christian and drinking of the living water of the Lord. Amen. Verse ten, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God. And who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So, of course, Jesus is God, and, and of course, God God can give anybody living water. And so that's what he's alluding to, you know, to here at verse 10. 
Verse 11, And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, from whence then thou then hast thou that living water. So she obviously quite confused by his statement. You know, you, you could you could easily see that. And, um, you know, no surprise there. And so verse 11 represents a skeptical argument that someone might make against the doctrine of Jesus Christ. You know, they're, they're skeptical of, of how, you know, taking the blood of Jesus Christ or accepting the free gift of salvation. How is that possible, right? It's, again, it's the skeptical argument of the world. And anyway, so, you know, it's just a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful picture uh, and a beautiful question that Jesus, you know, sort of a a statement Jesus makes to her and and her lack of understanding. Verse 12, Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water water shall thirst again, so that be of the well. Verse 14, but whomsoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And of course, the woman in in verse 15, it was amazing. Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she saw it as earthly work that she didn't no longer have to do uh, as a convenience. And... You know, it's um, isn't that fitting? Because that's how the world sees things: is if they do things under under the under the guise of is it convenient or not. Verse sixteen, Jesus said, saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. Verse seventeen, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Verse eighteen, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest saidest thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So she's like, hey, how did you know that, right? Uh, Essentially. And how did she have five husbands? I mean, think about that for a minute. You can only have one, right? Was she divorced five times? I don't think so. I don't think she was divorced five times. All right, let's go to verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And so, this is an interesting sort of statement um, here in verse twenty. If you if you look at it, and it's a doctrinal argument, um, in my opinion, to not worship there, to not accept, you know, not to think of God there and the place that they are. You know, it's uh, you know the doc, the, you know, the Jewish tradition says to worship in, in in Jerusalem. So I need not worship now, right? Like that idea. Or, hey, I'm not in a church. Why do I need to pray? Hey, I'm not in the house of God. I don't need to worry about God. Right? It's a similar sort of worldly argument. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Verse 22, Ye worship ye not, know not what, ye know what we worship, for, for salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Really a set of beautiful verses. Verse 24, God is a spirit, so we know God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and this is what the woman, woman will say. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come. He will tell us all things. And then Jesus reveals himself unto, unto her. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. he. So this woman knew scripture. You know, she knew about the Messiah. And it's really interesting, you know, that, you know, she, and of course, Jesus rewards her for knowing. And, um, you know, but when all else fails, you know, the sinner will, will postpone a decision, and we see that in verse 25. You know, she's trying to push the decision off. That's how I see this, right? Uh, she was waiting for her Messiah. She wasn't looking for the Father or, or serving, you know, God. She was waiting for the Messiah, which, you know, we, we as Christians wait for the Messiah, but we're, we're saved at this time a little different in the Old Testament. 
And so, um, you know, it's a, just a great example, and I wanted to show this set of verses of just the world and its problems of sinners that wanted to not accept the free gift of, of salvation in our church age. It's sort of a, you know, it's an application, right? It's it's not exact, you know, this was certainly during, John is certainly during the time of the Jews and, and the brethren and Jesus dealing with the Jews. But it's a, it's a dual application if you look at it in terms of the world and the problems of rejecting with different arguments that the world will use to to reject the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why I wanted to bring this forward. Don't be one of these people. I mean, don't use one of these arguments. This this girl uses all of them. She, you know, she uses, in verse 9, a skeptical argument or just one of culture. You know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, don't, don't do that. Verse 11, she uses a doctrinal argument. Well, you know, I, you know, I'm not in a church. I don't need to do that. Don't do that. God's always here. Don't postpone it and, and, and you know, put off the decision. And um, she uses a skeptical argument in verse 11 and a doctrinal argument in verse 20. So, so all these places she, she uses the, you know, these argument, these, these excuses, essentially, if you want to call it that. And sinners will do the same for the reason not to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, except, except the blood of Jesus Christ today. For your salvation, once saved, always saved, you know, is a thing. Uh, a lot of people get upset. I like to call it eternal security. Once saved, always saved, to me, ends with once you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then you be, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Then there's a walk. It's just two separate events. Uh, the walk with Jesus, and you should you receive the Holy Spirit. There is a higher level for you, and you will become one with the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing as you read His Word and as you learn His ways. But eternal security can be had by the blood of Jesus Christ today. God bless, and have a great day.